Hello, and welcome to the Yet Another Value podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker, and uh, with me today, I'm excited to have the writer of The Diff, the newsletter, and my friend, Bern Hobart. So, Bern, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Great. Well, hey, let me start this podcast the same way I do uh, every podcast, and that's by pitching you. And, you know, I've recently been reading the book Hamilton, uh, th that obviously the play's based on, and one of the things that jumps out at you when you read it is, you know, Hamilton, he's, he's reading military history and finance all this, and he's just expert at one after the other. And you're kind of like, oh, my God, how, how can this guy be so good at everything? And every now and then when I read your newsletter, I kind of get the same feeling where I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this guy's an expert on privacy and economic history and all these companies. And it's just, I mean, it's so widely buried. And, uh, you know, if you were only doing it once a week, I'd be like, oh, my God, this newsletter covers a lot. But to do it every day is just so impressive. It's one of my favorite newsletters. So... Uh, that's my plug. Thank you for coming on. I'm really happy to have you. And I was hoping you could maybe dive in and tell me, did I sell you too hard? And can you give us some background of yourself and how you came to do the diff? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the Hamilton comparison is, is really flattering. I think there's, there's a trick to sounding like, you know, a lot about everything, which is that if you know a lot about a handful of topics, you eventually find some commonalities between them. Like if you dive really deep into business history in one sector and into military history and into, I don't know, the arts or something, you'll find some of the same archetypes across them, like people who are really smart but don't get along with anyone and that's why they're not successful, or people who are pretty good in their field but actually really good at making friends. And like pretty good can vary a whole lot. Um, I read this biography of Robert Oppenheimer a while back and there, there was this quote from a physicist saying, you know, Oppenheimer, not that great a physicist he probably would should not have ever like no one would have thought he would win a nobel prize or something like that like it was like an incredibly high bar of like not one of the hundred greatest of the century not that good but you know for a guy who is not that good he still had a big impact because in, in Oppenheimer's case he made a lot of friends and was able to connect people and organize people and things like that so like those archetypes show up in a lot of different domains and you can do this trick where it looks like you found this really crazy, unprecedented comparison between, you know, how how France reformed its military in this period versus how airlines restructured after oil prices went up. But it, it turns out you just knew those two topics really well, and so of course you found the way to connect them. It's kind of like um, baseball doesn't explain everything, but people who use baseball analogies can use them in every domain. So um, it's if you didn't really care about baseball, you might assume that these people knew about everything. But if you knew that baseball analogies are a trope, then you'd be less impressed. So that's my trick. That's my secret. Um, there, there are giant, giant gaps in my knowledge. And then there are a few things I've just gotten really into over time. Great. Um, no, that's uh, really interesting. I love the baseball because as you said, it, the first thing is whenever you're doing anything, you say, oh, we're in inning three or inning seven, or he hit a grand slam. Like it, it, it's it makes tons of sense. Obviously, those are simplified and comparing French military history to oil prices in the 1970s is a little tougher, but it makes some sense. So uh, th that's how you became an expert at everything. But maybe tell us, you know, just a little bit about yourself, your background, how you came to write the diff. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I have a, a pretty eclectic background. Um, I, I got into stocks really early in middle school, basically. And um, spent way too much time reading about investing in high school and uh, not as much time as I really should have doing homework. So I ended up um, graduating from high school and um, not having, not really having my pick of colleges, which was disappointing. But um, <laughs> I, I went to college for a year on a full scholarship at Arizona State University. And I kind of decided, like I am learning, but um, I, I could be doing other things with my time and I should try something else and see if it works better. My, my thinking was if I drop out of school after freshman year and spend a year doing something else and then come back that I graduate in five years instead of four and it doesn't have a big effect on my life. But if it turns out that there are better ways to spend my time, then it's a really good move. So that's what I did, dropped out after freshman year, moved to New York, um, bounced around a couple jobs and ended up working in online marketing. And um, while I was working in online marketing, I started writing blog posts about internet companies. So this was in, um, 2010 and 2011, when there was this renaissance of online internet companies where they were, there were finally viable businesses that had been created online that could go public and not just coast on this late 90s hype cycle. So um, I started writing about those and especially writing about how you could use online marketing, market intelligence tools to track them. So 
if there's a company that spends a lot on um, on AdWords or that spends a lot on display ads or that gets a lot of organic traffic from Google, I found some ways to track those and see how they're performing over time and just get a deeper understanding of the business. And through doing that and writing about it, I, um, I managed to get in touch with someone at SAC Capital who liked my writing, talked to me for a while, decided this wave of internet IPOs is going to happen soon and that's going to keep going and um, that there weren't as many full-time internet analysts as there had been 10 years ago. So it was actually hard to find people who could get a handle on Facebook's business model or Twitter's business model or something like that. So um, I joined I joined SAC in 2012 and was there for two and a half years, learned a whole lot, did a lot with um, tracking internet companies, tracking traditional media companies, um, doing, doing stuff with data. This was pretty early in the alternative data era in finance, but um, and got, got early exposure to a lot of that stuff and then um, left them in 2014, um, bounced around a bit after that, so did some work in crypto uh, at a company called 21, which was really fun. Um, then spent a while as a more of a sell side analyst, so working at data firms, helping them write reports, contextualize data, and um, working with hedge funds to, to plug that data into their investing models and um, figure, out, figure out what to trade based on that. So was doing that for a while, but there's this dynamic with um, this trend with a lot of a uh, lot of professional money management where the area where they have an edge, it's a the edge is diminishing, and b the way that you actually get a decent risk adjusted return is you have a super diversified portfolio, a lot of different portfolio managers who are really really focused on one narrow thing, and um, they're they're generally supposed to not have a lot of market exposure to be um, long, short, and have minimal exposure to the overall market. And in some cases, this gets really extreme. Like I talked to people who would trade cruise lines, they analyze cruise lines. Um, there are three and the mandate was tight enough that you were either long one and short the other two or long two and short the other one. There were just not a lot of ways to do anything really exciting mm -hmm. um, if your mandate is have no net exposure to the industry and pick good stocks within it. So um, it seemed like it was, the industry was getting more and more focused on pretty short-term developments and, um, and also on, on just not having, on, on, on being able to understand the cadence of data. So back in the day, you would, if you were a short-term investor, one of the things you'd do is trade ahead of the border. So you think they're gonna beat, you buy, you think they're gonna miss, you sell, and that's how you made your money, but now, the timeline has gotten shorter because there are so many intra-quarter data sets. So it's more like there are five different companies releasing different reports based on credit card data. We know roughly when each report comes out, we have the underlying credit card data ourselves. So we are not trying to predict how well this company, we're not trying to predict the value of this company as a business. We're not trying to predict how well the company does this quarter. We are now trying to predict what, what change in investor opinion will happen over the next week based on what data is being released. So that turns into this very adversarial game because you're making money by trading against people who have slightly worse data than you. And that, that, tends, to, um, that tends to lead to this weird, weird situation where the stocks track the performance of the business really well throughout the quarter. And then when the quarterly report comes out, whatever it is the data sets either don't track or completely got wrong, that's what drives the stock. So stocks have gotten a little bit less volatile intra-quarter, way more volatile at the quarter. And there's just a lot of economic pressure not to think about the next five to 10 years, but that's the stuff I find really interesting. So um, I decided to, to take a break and see if I could make a living writing. Um, did that in a couple different venues, did some consulting as well. And then um, earlier this year, I started a subscription newsletter on Substack, The Diff, and that's been going really well. And um, I think part of what happened is that there are, there are a lot of people who will read a given article and find it interesting or not, but it's really hard to create your audience every time you publish something. Mm -hmm. like there are people who can do it, and that's part of why people use things like Twitter and Facebook. That's also why people work at mainstream outlets is those outlets create your audience for you or they help you create your audience. But with email newsletters, you can find people who are not just interested in one thing you said, but interested in the next thing that you look into and who are interested in not just, are you going to follow these stories everyone is talking about, but are you going to identify weird stories that are not getting as much attention or that matter for the narrative around large cap tech stocks, but that are not usually um, thought of as relevant to large cap tech stocks. So 
that's a lot of what I do is I, I try to look for the inflection points, um, ways the future will be different 10 years from now that we can identify today. And then I try to look at how those are playing out. Um, the other reason I call it the diff is that it's, um, so diff is a, a Unix command that just says, take two files, give me a list of all the ways they're different as compactly as possible. So what I'm trying to do is take the, um, take the, the overall flow of news about finance, about the macro situation and about tech companies, et cetera, and just try to extract what's actually valuable or what, what I think everyone is getting wrong and just publish that. So it's not, I'm not trying to do all of the news. Um, there are a lot of people who do that. And so that's a very competitive area. I'm trying to do what those, what the main news sites will typically miss or the connections they won't make. Well, that was great. That was a lot. I, I actually, every time you hit on a different subject, very similar to your newsletter, every time you hit on a different subject, I had a different question for you. But, uh, you know, let me dive into one just for you, right? You publish the diff every day. Uh, I, I think the insights are great and everything, but you publish it every day. Obviously, that's a conscious choice. Why, why go one, why go every day versus once a week, once a month? You know, if you're doing once a week, you could focus on specifically one story, dive deeper, make sure it's something you really want to be writing about. Where one of the issues with, you know, if you do something every day, some days there might just be nothing you want to write about. So why go daily versus weekly, monthly, yearly? Sure. So I, I do have some longer term projects. Like I'm, I'm working on a book with a friend and that is a, a multi-year project. We, we thought it would be uh a shorter project, but it's gotten more Finance involved. books, uh, finance, fantasy. So this one, uh, <laughs> semi-fantasy, I guess it's, it's about the, um, so there's this book, The Rise and Fall of American Growth. It's all about how um, productivity growth was really high in the middle of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And um, it looked like it was just getting higher and higher and higher. Every, every half century, something would change and the rate at which growth went would, would accelerate. And then things started slowing down around 1971 and no one really knows why. And Part of, part of this book is trying to look at some of the specific um, moonshots that really drove a lot of growth. And one of them is a literal moonshot, the Apollo program. That's, that's the chapter we're working on right now. So we're just trying to understand everything about the Apollo program that made it work, um, whether that's the political setup, like how, how did this get approved? Why, why did we decide to spend, um, I think in present dollars, it's um, over 100, maybe $200 billion. Why do we do this for this sort of vanity project? Um, Was it that little? It was, I think, twenty billion in dollars at the time. Um, I could have this off. Um, it was, anyway. It was, it was a significant chunk of GDP, and um, maybe it speaks to how warped I am by like the current budget deficits and spending and stuff. But you say two hundred billion, I'm like, oh, that's like less. That's one bailout package right now. Well, you know? yeah. There's, there's also the fact that um, real GDP is a lot higher now. So, yeah, yeah. and when you, it's always, it's always tricky to make these long-term historical comparisons because. The farther back you go, the less you're actually comparing meaningfully similar quantities. Like if you look at GDP in a, a subsistence economy, um, discretionary income is basically zero because everyone works really hard to generate enough calories not to starve to death. And most of the time that's what happens and they don't starve to death and then occasionally they do. Um, so you can say the market value of wheat was X and this is how much wheat was produced in this country and therefore their GDP was Y, but it's not GDP in the sense of you could actually shift it around. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a defense budget means people are dying. So um, that makes the comparison hard. But then if you look today, one of the reasons our budgets are so high is that we have a lot more, um, a lot more services, especially healthcare and, um, and education. We have a lot more people who are out of the workforce, uh, mostly for demographic reasons. So a lot of our budget just goes to things like that. And that's part of GDP. It's part of the federal budget, but it wasn't nearly as big a factor when life expectancies were shorter and there was just less, there were fewer fancy ways to save people's lives at, at great expense. Um, regardless, it was, it was a huge expense. It's not the kind of expense we do anymore. Um, it was a hugely risky project. Like we, we literally didn't know if it was physically possible. Um, the Russians, Russia demonstrated in uh, 1957 that you could launch a living thing into space. And then um, 1959, they demonstrated that they could actually get a living thing back from space, um, a little bit of a gap there. Um, apparently there, there are still living descendants of the first dogs that Russia successfully sent into space and then retrieved afterwards. They're still around. Um, that's a long, t that's a, those are old dogs. Descendants. Yeah. Yeah. But, but so, even descendants, right? Because most dogs live about 
these 10 are like to 15 great, years. great, great, great grandchildren. Okay, okay. I thought you meant the actual. Children. No, not the actual kids. No. These dogs are. Let, let me ask you. So I, I, it's funny you mentioned Apollo because every time you mention Apollo, uh, I, I love that you mentioned it because your insights have been so interesting there. And it's actually one of the things you've mentioned it so many times. And I've been really curious. I've, I've had a blind spot to it. I'm thinking about figuring out a book to read on it. If we announce tomorrow, hey, we're going to send someone to Mars in 10 years. Would that be of equivalent, greater or lesser difficulty than kind of Kennedy announcing he was going to send a man to the moon in 10 years in the early 60s? So my read on this is that it would be technically a lot easier, but uh, politically and organizationally a lot harder. And like we we're just very averse to doing anything that is novel, has an uncertain possibly positive, possibly negative outcome, and where people can die if you mess up. That's just not something we're, I think America at least is, is very much okay with people dying sort of accidentally as a side effect of a decision, but not okay with them dying as the direct effect of a decision. So- Do you think that's because politicians are better today at gaming out, like like with, the, with Corona, right? If you spent $5 billion at the beginning of this year on virus prevention, you may have lost your job, right? People would have been coming at you and saying you were, a pro now if you had spent that with, with the benefit of hindsight, people would have been like, you deserve all the awards, take all the awards, take everything, right? So do you think politicians are saying, hey, if I spend $200 billion going to Mars in 10 years, I might not even be office, I'm gonna get blasted for wasting money, or do you think it's just because the country is so politically kind of at each other's throats that we just can't get the consensus? Yeah, like I think even even going back to the 1960s, the political situation was pretty challenging for Apollo. In fact, um, like there, it's one of those multiplicative things where there are a lot of things where if one thing had gone wrong, um, we wouldn't have gone to the moon, or if one person hadn't participated, we would not have gone to the moon. And one of the people who was basically essential for us to get to the moon was probably Lee Harvey Oswald, because um, once once JFK had been assassinated, Apollo became this thing we were doing in to honor someone in his memory yep. popular, and especially popular in retrospect <clears throat> like <clears throat> he was um he was certainly popular as the president but not he was much more popular as a uh, as the late president um so that that is part of why it happened was um a lot of the american public wanted it to be done for that reason um lbj wanted it to be done for that reason lbj also really wanted it done because by then a lot of the work was happening in houston so um it was to his benefit for, for Houston to be this, this center for space exploration. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot of, but I think the, the political challenges are just um, much more dire right now. Like it's a lot easier to create a viral narrative around something about how it's a waste of, of money. Um, you can already imagine the tweets about how many people we could send to college, how many people we could feed, how, you know, how, many, um, how much insulin we could buy. Well, not much, but you know, how much insulin we could theoretically buy if, if prices were lower, et cetera. There are just a lot, of, a lot of ways to spend the money. And I think people are a lot more aware of that. There's, there's that ritual paradox where to tax people really heavily, you generally need to let them vote. But once they vote, they actually care about how the money is getting spent. So countries with a large tax base and a lot of electoral participation are just run very differently from countries that don't have that. And um, when you look at a lot of the countries that have gone through a, uh, have gone from poor to uh, middle income and especially poor to rich, a lot of them have um, not especially democratic systems. Like even countries that are ostensibly democratic like Japan, if you look at how decisions were actually made in Japan, um, <clears throat> the legislature was pretty much rubber stamped. Like um, bureaucrats could introduce bills and legislators could introduce bills. This is from the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, the bills that legislators introduced were almost universally shot down. They would just get voted down by their legislators because it was usually someone would say, well, in my hometown, we should build a big bridge. And then everyone would say, well, that's tax dollars from my hometown that don't go to my constituents, so no. But when the industrial planners would say, we've chosen the site for a new steel mill and I think we should build it, then everyone votes yes. So um, it was democratic in the sense that people voted, there were elections, there was somebody in charge, but um, it was non-democratic in the sense that there, the actual decisions were made in this very hierarchical form where there was a bureaucracy that was self-sustaining, super elite, um, had really rigorous testing standards, made people work extremely hard, um, had kind of an up or out approach to promoting people and this very, very linear promotion path. But once you got to the top, you were extremely well qualified, you knew everyone there was to know, and you had effectively unlimited power to rearrange the economy. So 
Um, it seems like that that's just something you you sort of need. And the fact that Apollo was partly a military project with a lot of military participation meant that it did have that more top-down approach where there was just not a lot of feedback from the electorate or a lot of the feedback was patently disregarded. Uh, you know, I, I want to dive in more here, but I also want to get into the death of Fang. And I want to go back to one more question, the diff. One day versus one week versus once a month. Yes. Why, okay. why every day? Um, so I found when I think about when I've been really productive, it's usually the 24 hours before a deadline. Like I've done a lot of projects at work and for fun where I give myself two months to do it and most of it still gets done in the last day. Um, sometimes I have this screenshot from a time when I initiated coverage on an industry and um, it was going to be done, I think, on a... Uh, on a Tuesday morning, so I had to get everything done by Monday night. And my, I took a screenshot of my inbox at the end of Monday because my first email was sent at like 4.07 in the morning and the last <laughs> one was sent at like 11.30 at night. So I was really proud of that. Um, but that's, that's sort of how I end up working is that I'm very sensitive to deadlines, but only when they're very close. So I decided to just give myself more deadlines so spread out very closely. Um, I've done some things where I work on it for a while and then end up publishing later on. Like I have things that are posts that are in the works where I actually have to do more background reading. And I'm also, a lot of the time I'm working on something in the background before I decide to write about it. Like I, I'm reading, reading books on different topics or collecting um, news stories on a topic that I'm going to write about at some point. But since most of my write-ups are not that time sensitive, I can publish it pretty much whenever. Yep, yep, yep. No, that's it. And I love the point on deadlines because like one of the struggles I've had with um, with COVID and working from home is like I like my structure, right? So I, I was wondering if having something every day, like I come in for you, if it was for you, I come in every day and I start writing. I know I need to get next tomorrow's newsletter out, like if that structure was helpful. Because for me, COVID, it's been so hard. Like my structure was, hey, I wake up at six. I leave the house at 645. I'm at the office by seven work, you know, work from seven to five, seven to six, take a break for lunch stuff, come home, get a little bit more work done. Not having that structure of getting out of the house has kind of made, I feel like I'm working as much, but I'm more scattershot because I don't have that rigor. So uh, yeah, I was just wondering that. Anyway, uh, anything else here? Or are you ready to move on to Death of Fang? Yeah, let's do Death of Fang. Great. So uh, this week you've been, and I've been honored, it was inspired by a post of mine where I said, hey, you know, if you look over history, uh, the, the market leaders in terms of market cap at the start of the decade, very rarely do many, any of them survive to be the market leaders at the end of the decade. And right now, kind of the FANG stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, you can throw Microsoft, Google, and Netflix in there. They just seem inevitable, right? They're the biggest companies, the most profitable, most powerful, fastest growing. They just seem inevitable. But it, history tells us it is likely that in 10 years, many of them will not be at the top of the charts. One of them will has spectacularly failing. It seems so difficult now. Anyway, I'll, I'll let you, I'll turn it over to you. I'll let you dive a little further into the series and how you wrote it. Yeah, yeah. So the way that I thought about it was, as an investor, you're always being paid to take risk. And you can think of the equity risk premium as that that payment. And there has to be some risk. Like it's if, if there's no risk, it's a treasury. So um, part of the exercise was just asking, what is the risk that you're actually getting paid to take when you buy Alphabet or Facebook or Netflix. And um, you can give the obvious answer of uh, some of these stocks look really expensive. Um, and I didn't really touch that at all because when I look at their business models, most of them have some form of recurring revenue and they have some way to invest OPEX and get revenue, get very high margin incremental revenue over a very long period. So when rates are really low, um, that kind of model is extremely valuable. And um, depending on what assumptions you make, you can you can easily mess up your discounted cash flow analysis and say these companies have an infinite value. Like if you if you make the right, right assumption about what long-term inflation looks like, what long-term rates look like, and how much Netflix can increase prices over time, you can easily get to an argument that actually the net present value of their cash flow is infinite. So that's that's clearly not true. Clearly something can go wrong in the meantime. But I wanted to look at some of the explicit reasons that a particular company could do poorly. So for a lot of these write-ups, um, regulation is a factor, but it's it's too easy to just say, well, Facebook could be forced to divest everything they've ever bought and mm -hmm. then they'd be worth less. It's more fun to go through the event path because 
Um, that could have happened, but it didn't happen. So what will make it happen is, I think, the interesting question to ask. And, and look, I, let's stay on regulation for a second. So I think you and I emailed about these a little bit. I was happy to, I, I was really thrilled to talk about it, but you obviously drove most everything. But regulation was the thing we kept coming back to for a lot of these guys, right? Like what happens if regulation? And you know, I, I guess history, I, I was telling you earlier, to me, history suggests that uh, regulation is not what kills an industry. And I think you had a different take on it. Like to me, the last time something really got killed by a, a market leader getting killed by regulation, it was very difficult for me to come up with the one, but you had a, a couple of different ones. I was hoping you could go through those maybe. Yeah, happy to. So I, I suspect, like I've, I've seen this pattern where when there's a category of company that becomes the largest by market cap or like a one of the most significant by market cap there's usually some kind of reversal and often it is driven by policy mm -hmm. like the more the more powerful an industry gets the more it becomes a threat to the government's ability to to do things and governments are much more powerful than companies so they respond to those threats accordingly and um my thinking was if you look back at 2007 the banks were becoming huge and um, financial revenue as a financial profits as a share of s p profits were at historically high levels and it's you can't really point to any regulatory change that um that forced those companies to to get smaller there were always these incremental tweaks um you could say that that some of the the relaxing of mortgage standards created this race to the bottom and that since mortgage availability affected housing prices and housing prices affected mortgage default rates, that it indirectly, indirectly regulation killed them. But that certainly wasn't the purpose of, uh, of regulations that, that favored uh, lower standards for mortgages. Um, what I think you can say is that you can only have a huge financial sector in, um, you can only have a huge financial sector if the government is willing to backstop major banks, if the government is willing to do the, the very traditional central bank approach of when there's a liquidity crisis, which we know there will be at some point, we will lend to everyone who needs it and we'll make sure that the system doesn't run out of cash, even though it, it might take an equity hit. And that didn't really happen in the 2008 crisis, um, mm -hmm. especially part of what happened was just a lot of the people who had short-term dollar borrowings were not in the US. So it was just more technically and politically difficult to get dollars to where they where they needed to go, but also the system had gotten really, really complicated to the point that um, it was it was kind of unclear what the magnitude was. And then once it was clear what the magnitude of the dollar shortage was, it was just politically really hard for the Fed to say things are going really, really terribly and um, <laughs> everyone is suffering. And that's why we are giving hundreds of billions of dollars to big banks. And <clears throat> they still get politically punished for the fact that they did that. But it was it was the right decision as step one of dealing with the crisis where step two is make sure that they don't get that levered ever again and make sure that they don't have as much short much reliance on short-term wholesale funding and that to a large extent has happened like if you look at the the way banks have performed in this crisis um they've done a great job and part of the reason is they have a whole lot more capital let me let me ask you a question on, on this crisis so i and i haven't thought deeply enough through this yet but you know in 2008 i you can remember like the, the days where the house first voted down the bailout package and markets were down. And obviously markets were, I think markets drove a lot of what happened here, right? Where, Hey, we're not going to shut the country down or something stocks down 10%. Okay. We're going to shut, shut the country down. But you know, one of the things the fed did here was they stepped in instantly. Right. I yes. mean, for a second, it looked like everything was going to freeze. And the fed said, you know, they just sprayed everything with liquidity. Do you think that was them learning lessons from 2008 or was there just some different mix of, uh, kind of political power here that resulted in that? Why do you think the Fed was so much faster, so much more aggressive here? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I think they learned a lot from 2008. And one of the things that they learned was, or maybe internalized, was when people start running out of money, there are a lot more, uh, a lot more companies going through a liquidity crisis than you see in the headlines. And Part of, part of having a sufficiently high risk tolerance such that you lever up way more than you should is you also have the risk tolerance necessary to just um, extend and pretend day by day and not admit to your creditors that you're totally insolvent. So when you see some liquidity crises, you know that it's getting worse. The other thing that they learned, um, one of the constraints in 2008 was that oil prices were so high that they were the Fed and ECB were worried about inflation up until the summer of 2008. 
they, yep. they thought that was a bigger problem. So um, <clears throat> they felt like they had a lot less firepower. And then of course, oil prices crashed right afterwards and um, the oil, oil supply situation is totally different now than it was then. So in some ways, in some ways the Fed did a lot better. In some ways the Fed just had fewer constraints because of frackers. Um, and those two things, the confluence of those two things just meant that the Fed was way more effective this round. It's just funny how everything like is somewhat loosely connected, right? Like who would have, who would have thought frackers had some incremental thing in helping the Fed bail out the, the COVID crisis? But uh, something you mentioned when you were talking about the government, when a sector gets big enough, the government likes to start uh, shutting it down because they see a threat in it, right? Financial, financial profits got too big. Financial people have too much power. The government maybe starts to crack down. I mean, you say that and I say, what has the most, what has the potential for the most power? And tech obviously has the most profits, but it's not just that. Like we've seen from 2016 and all across the world, tech can also literally influence the voters and literally change the government. So you say that and I say, oh my God, like just alarm bells are going off in my head. Regulation is going to come for this harder, than, probably harder than anyone thinks at some point. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, Earl, I, the tech companies are in a really tough situation because in some ways they are just reflecting the way that human beings behave yeah. and people spread rumors, people vote for dumb reasons, people try to influence other people to vote also for dumb reasons. Um, the scope of, of Russia's political manipulation in 2016 is um, way more minimal, at least the, the stuff that happened specifically on Facebook, way more minimal than, than um, people typically assume. Like I think the ad budget was something like $100,000 this is really minor compared to the ad budgets of the Trump or Clinton campaigns. Um, and they were also, they were not just trying to help Trump. They were also just trying to cause chaos in all sorts yep. of ways. So they, they would do things like try to hold two rallies for very black lives matter groups. and black lives don't matter. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, they, each other. yeah, exactly. So, so they, they were certainly trying to cause trouble, but um, the extent to which they, like my, my working theory is that they wanted Trump to lose by a small margin because they knew that if Trump thought that he almost won and somehow got cheated out of it, that Hillary would have no legitimacy or far less legitimacy, far less political flexibility. I think that's what they were going for. I think they overshot. And, um, and I think a lot, of, um, a lot of people just underestimated Trump and they, they underestimated the extent to which the polling data missed people who were more likely to vote for Trump. And we you know, still don't I, understand entirely how that happened. I, I hear that, but I also think there's something with, uh, and I don't want to get too into politics weeds here, but like, I think there's something with James Comey's letter. Uh, we're reopening the case, you know, what, six days before the election. Yeah, that like, was just wacky. <laughs> I what, still don't understand what he was thinking. Yeah, it, it, it's just absolutely insane. But anyway, uh, let's see. So let's go back to, so you did it on Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Google, I think you had one on Netflix and Microsoft yeah. today, right? So Amazon's tomorrow, I, I, the last that's one right. I remember. Yep. So that's six companies. What, when you were writing these, like, what was the company you were most surprised when you were, hey, like I went into this thinking they were bulletproof, but oh man, I see some risks here. Or conversely, hey, I went into this thinking, I, I see some risk here, but as I dive a little bit more into it, I think, I think this is a lot stronger than I thought. Yeah, Google was one where it was, you could come up with ways that the business wouldn't do as well as it had done recently, but it was actually really hard to come up with things that would actively destroy Google other than just a really crazy aggressive antitrust thing or, you know, yeah. European, European courts trying to tax, like trying to find Google for absurd amounts of money. Like that stuff could happen, but um, the actual core of the business is really good and they've been able to adapt to a lot of the changes that were threatening them. Like, um, for a while, when people were bearish on mobile as an advertising medium, there was that concern that search is moving to mobile faster than Google is getting good at monetizing it. And Google was able to address that by just integrating the bidding and, um, and basically doing a lot of the optimization for the advertisers. Um, Google was also able to circumvent the problem of apps, where one of the worries for a while was instead of doing a mobile search on Google and then going to a site that people would rather open an app and make a purchase, like open a Wayfair app and buy something. And um, now Google lets you link to individual pages in an app. So, um, so the ads can point to exactly where they should be. And since apps convert really well relative to mobile pages, that, that actually meant that um, it was often a bit more for those, uh, more for those clicks. And of course the value of someone who signs up 
who um, does a search, purchases a product through an app, and then is logged into that app and can bother them with push notifications and you have more data on them. That's, that's pretty high as well. So a lot of the things that look like risks to Google also look like things that Google has dealt with. And the core search business, like typing text into a search bar and getting a list of links, that's a business with really, really strong network effects because you want to um, you want to continuously improve search results, and the way to do that is looking at a lot of clickstream data and seeing what search results work and which ones don't. And then the other thing that they've been doing a little bit of over time, they've experimented with over time, is trying to build more vertical search where instead of sending you to a page, they might send you to a tool that's Google controlled and. The way that I think about this is for something like hotel search, where it used to be you Google hotels in NYC and you get a link to hotels.com and booking.com and Expedia and all that. And, and now you actually get a search interface and you can shop directly. And then that, that shopping is fulfilled by one of those online travel agencies. I think the way Google was thinking about that was we don't want to give any advertiser a conversion rate advantage. We want to minimize the conversion rate advantage for advertisers because when the best advertiser has a really large advantage, they capture all the incremental value of bidding for the top click and paying whatever they have to pay to be number one and yep. then getting all the incremental traffic from that. Um, everything they do to improve their conversion rate also improves their ROI on those ads. And that means that the more they improve their search relative to Google search, the more they benefit from the Google search they're getting. So Google's very afraid of that. and. Google wants it to be a level playing field when, when Booking.com and Expedia, who have phenomenal conversion optimization teams and uh, phenomenal advertising teams, like when they're when they're competing with lesser, smaller OTAs, Google wants it to be a more fair fight because that's also a fight where where those companies have to pay a larger portion of their margin to Google. Let me click on that real quick. So, uh, when you broke it down like that, obviously. I think most people know, hey, the reason Google is opening their own, hey, book through Google Hotels instead of Expedia or something is because they can capture a lot of money by doing that, right? Like if they offer it themselves. But originally when I heard of it, I kind of thought this is a mistake. It all comes back to re regulation, right? Like Yelp sued Google because Google, instead of showing Yelp at the top, Google started doing their own. And that's big bad Google beating up on Yelp. Uh, opening up hotels, opening up airlines, that's big bad Google. I don't think anybody would say little old booking.com or something, but you know, if you piss off booking.com, you piss off Yelp, you piss off enough of these people, there, there's political enemies to be made there, and regulation will come down on you. Do you, do you think they, they thought that through properly or do you think this increases their kind of regulation risk in the long term? I'm sure it incrementally increases their risk um, and I'm sure that's part of what they discuss. And in fact, I think that's, that's really the way to think about how these risks affect big tech companies is that it's not so much that they will be forced to undo something and that they'll pay a big fine. It's that now they have more meetings where instead of talking about, is this product going to be profitable? They're talking about, is this product going to be legal? And mm -hmm. is this product going to, if we launch one more vertical search, does this mean we don't just lose that, but we lose every other vertical search product we've launched? So it makes them more cautious. And that was, that was part of what I talked about in the Microsoft write-up was just Microsoft spent a long time trying very hard not to be sued, and as a secondary goal, trying to grow their business. Um, since a lot of these companies are growth companies, the multiple can re-rate pretty strongly if they go from a growth company that you can count on to keep launching new products and, and keep um, monetizing the usage it has to a company that you know what you're getting and it's not gonna change that much. And, yep. and so there's there's no optimistic outcome. It's, uh, it's just stable or it's like, for Google, it's actually kind of lumpy because they're a variable cost for all of their advertisers and they're the easiest cost to turn off. So everyone can cut spending to zero. When you compare Google and Facebook, um, with Google, since they're selling ads that are targeted to individual searches, when spending goes to zero, it's not like there are other bidders for that inventory. Whereas with Facebook, and this was uh, Ben Thompson's excellent point uh, a couple of weeks ago after the boycotts, when someone, when a branded advertiser stops spending on Facebook, prices tick down until the direct response advertisers can afford to bid on those page views. And since yep. the ads aren't targeted to any one topic, they're just whatever you see when you're browsing Facebook, um, the ad inventory has a lot of potential bidders and everyone in online gaming has built their entire business around what is the ROI at various price points for Facebook ads. And, and this is, Google saw that this in March and April, right? Like if you were searching, if you were, they make tons of money on hotel bidding, right? March and April, 
travel goes completely away. And I think Expedia said, hey, we cut out a billion dollars of Google advertising, right? So right. absolutely. Uh, one of the things that struck me when you and I were emailing about this, like you say, hey, what can kill Google? And your first thought is, oh, search goes away, right? For, for some reason, search goes away. And then you say, oh, well, Google also owns YouTube and Google also owns Gmail and Google Docs and Waymo. And we can debate the value of all of these, but there's no doubt that there's val somewhere between some call option value to just tons of value in YouTube, right? So all these guys tend to have it. Amazon has Amazon and AWS. Uh, Apple's pretty much only Mac, but the one that strikes me is Netflix, right? Netflix is the only one that is really a pure, pure play bet on one thing. Netflix is a pure play bet on streaming. So when you wrote this up, where did you fall on the risk of Netflix going away? Yeah, so Netflix was the one that I thought had the most risk because um, streaming works as a product. It works really well. Netflix has a lot of great shows, but streaming also works as part of a bundle of other things. So Amazon um, Prime. Exactly. So yeah. Amazon's doing that a lot. Um, and AT&T is doing that as well. And uh, Spectrum is doing stuff as well. So you have a lot of different companies that are saying video content can help us reduce churn for something that has a much higher dollar value. And so even though our margin on video is not great, the actual dollar ROI on adding video to our bundle is really great. And it's still, Netflix still has differentiated stuff and they've really worked hard to build out a library that no one else can match in terms of just how many shows they have that are total cultural events. But as more companies try to turn, try to create a subscription product that includes video, but is not based on video, the that means bidding up on the production cost for creating new video content. And um, there was a piece in the journal, a pretty, like I think a couple of weeks ago, talking about um, some of the smarter real estate PE shops starting to buy film lots because mm -hmm. they, in places like, um, in, in California, it's just hard to build new stuff. And so if there's higher demand for the existing lots, then that just means higher rents. So you could you could expect some inflation there. Um, that market, on the TV production side, my understanding is that it's pretty heavily unionized. Like you, you can't really um, hire, you can't hire a crew unless um, all of them are union basically. So, um, so unions are pretty good at taking any kind of increase in margin at their employer and turning that into higher wages and fixed higher wages. So you would tend to have those expenses ratchet up when times are good, they don't ratchet down when times are bad. Um, unions, they basically own a, a sort of convertible instrument on whatever company they work for. So when things go really well, they ask for profit, sh profit sharing. There were cases with the airlines where um, one of the unions was offered profit sharing. They said, this is stupid because airlines don't make money, just pay us higher wages. And then when, I think this was American, when the airlines started actually earning really high profits, the unions were like, you were the only major airline that doesn't offer profit sharing. And this is outrageous <laughs> too. So it's a, it's a convertible. Um, and it's really tough to, it's really tough to run a profitable business when part of your cost structure owns either equity or debt, depending on which one's better to own. So that just means, that means that, that Netflix would face some pressure on the revenue side where if everyone else, every other video subscription is free because you're already buying Prime or you're already getting internet access mm -hmm. and then Netflix is the one you pay extra for, that's a tougher sell. And then they face the, the pressure on the cost side. Um, you can also, we can certainly look at, at Disney doing its play in that area. Disney is very, very different from, from what some of the other streaming providers are doing just because they, they have um, unique ownership of some IP. They also, because they are a media conglomerate, they have a lot of different ways to monetize a given piece of intellectual property. So they can, they can do streaming and not make an especially large amount of money on it because it gives them a better negotiating standpoint with theaters. They can, they could say, we, we could put this in theaters, but if you don't give us a better deal, we'll just give it to Disney Plus subscribers instead. And then for the content that in the back catalog that gets a lot of interaction, but that Disney didn't know was popular for whatever reason, then they can make more money on that with their parks. Um, right now, all of that stuff is very tough to do and seems unexciting, but um, at some point, COVID, we will either have a vaccine or um, have sufficient behavioral changes that amount to a vaccine to keep R0 below one, or we will just decide um, herd immunity is the best we can do. And one of those things has to come true 
at some point in the next few years. Yeah, with with Netflix, the one thing. So my last podcast with uh, Marsh Belly, we were t- there was a quote from the Uber CEO where he said, "Hey, look, all of our uh, all of our competitors for a long time had basically a zero cost of capital, and when all of your competitors have a zero cost of capital, you know, it's tough to show off your network effects, right? Because everybody else can just who cares if they can bid at a loss. And with Netflix, the thing I worry about is I have no doubt they have network effects, right? They have the best users, the best they have the most users, the best data, all this type of stuff. I have no doubt about that." But my worry is Disney Plus can monetize in some other way. Apple can monetize in all, some other way. So in many ways, their competitors have a zero cost of capital, right? Because Apple might say, hey, we can lose some money on this because it's going to help us make money on the phones and people spend more time on their phones. So the one thing I worry with Netflix is they've got network effects, no doubt about it. But if every competitive product has no, net, no cost of capital, in the long run, that can be pretty scary. Uh, speaking of Apple, that's just the one... To me, they're the most exposed to regulation just because you see it with the Fortnite bat- the epic Fortnite battle right now with the App Store. I could see a lot of different ways it goes, but you know, they've got everything locked in. You have, if you want anything on iOS, anything on App Store, you have to go through them. I think they're probably the most exposed to regulation. Maybe Amazon just because they're such a big beast, but I, I think probably Apple's the most exposed. Just maybe dive in for a second. Do you agree with me there? Dive into a- how you could see kind of Apple, the largest company in the world, getting killed. Yeah, sure. So Apple, I think, was the one um, the one that is usually included in some variant on Fang that I did not end up writing up because I wanted to do five. Uh, it was pretty arbitrary. But um, yeah, Apple Apple is definitely exposed to regulation. They're exposed in the sense that there's there's the whole antitrust risk around the App Store, and that we still have to develop some new theory of tech antitrust that mm-hmm. that can deal with this because. Um, they don't have a monopoly on smartphones, as they point out over and over and over again. Um, Google does charge the same thing. So it's it's really not as if they're charging extortionate prices for something that they control. It's more like they're charging market prices for something that is really valuable. But maybe that's somewhat collusive or like indirectly collusive that, that both parties chose the same cut. Um, then they also have the regulatory risk of uh, China risk. So a whole lot of their supply chain runs through Shenzhen. Um, a whole lot of their revenue is China revenue, and um, that just gives them a lot of service area for getting hit by any kind of foreign policy yep. to, uh, of any sort. So whether it's um, China has, has started telling them they have to actually follow some of the rules that they've been skirting before. Um, they have this special tariff zone, um, this bonded zone where they do a lot of their manufacturing. So they get special tariff treatment in China. That could go away. Um, WeChat gets banned. That and gets banned globally by the U.S. or like if U.S. companies are not allowed to uh, let users down with WeChat, then, then iPhones in China are worthless, or at least they're, they're a way to signal, I don't actually live here. Um, so so that, that takes away a lot of their revenue. So they, they have a lot of these, this random regulatory exposure. And then on the App Store, maybe the better outcome for them is that they make some kind of concession to Epic and to publishers and to everybody else who is now saying that Apple takes a huge chunk of the revenue, doesn't provide nearly as much value, and, um, and that it's just not, not fair and not appropriate, and they're bullies. Like, all of that is true. A lot of it is sort of something they backed into. Like, early on, they just didn't think the App Store would be that big. They thought it would help them sell phones. And as it grew, the the pricing became more of a sticking point for for participants, but it was uh, there was no real catalyst until now for them to actually adjust that pricing. Now I think that since so much value passes through the app store, that they can probably find some way to capture similar amounts of value without just having a fixed cut. Like I think of Taobao and how um, listing is free, but they they make money by ranking products. So they, they basically sell ads on what's otherwise a, a free peer-to-peer platform. And that model is perfect price discrimination, but it works really well for commodity products. And on Taobao, as long as you want 5,000 of it, you could buy anything super cheap. Um, doesn't work super well for games or, or productivity apps or health apps or anything where you do actually have sensitivity to the brand. So They'll have to rearrange it somehow, but um, I think that some price discrimination would probably be useful for them and that um, they will eventually, enough of these independent publishers or enough of these um, publishers who are actually part of large companies will get together and force them to come to some compromise. Cool. So I, I think we, we've hit on a couple of them. So just to life down. 
So 10 years from now, you and I are doing a follow-up po podcast. What company do you think we're most going to be talk most likely to be saying, yep, this company fell, fell off the cliff, you know, and it doesn't have to be, I, I want to be clear, like a lot of people say it, it's the fall. It doesn't have to be a complete zero, right? But down 50%, down 20% in the markets up. It, it's nowhere close to as important today as in 10 years from now, as it, is, it seems like it will be today. Yeah, I, I have to go with with Netflix. Um, the valuation, and I said I wouldn't talk about valuation, but yeah. I'm doing it anyway. Valuation just gives them fairly far to fall. Um, and there are just so many companies that are trying to do the same thing. That said, the more I dug into these companies, the more I realized they're all exceptionally well run and all the managers are just deeply paranoid. Like I think the CEOs of every one of these companies sleep with a copy of Only the Paranoid Survive under their pillow. They've just absorbed this idea that there are always inflection points, that technology changes really fast, and that you have to be five steps ahead of your competitors because they will be at least four steps ahead of you. So they're, they're all super aware of this stuff. And um, I think Netflix is the one where there's not a natural pivot. There's not a natural way for them to extend into yeah. a different market and counter. Like, they can't start selling a smartphone and then have Apple economics, um, like have Apple streaming economics. They can't open up hundreds of warehouses and have an offer Netflix Prime that's Netflix plus groceries and electronics. Um, they they probably are not going to start an ISP, although um, they certainly have cheap capital and that's what you need. So maybe they'll do something like that or threaten to or joke about it on a conference call. And, uh, as a, uh, as a cable shareholder, I, I shudder to think that. No, just on the CEO, you know, it's interesting you say it because the one I think of, you know, I, I go through all these in my head and most of them are founder led, right? Netflix founder led, uh, Amazon founder led, uh, Apple is no longer founder led, but Tim, Tim Cook's great. The one that comes to mind is as such an interesting case study is Microsoft, right? Because they had Bill Gates obviously took over the world, Obama ran it for what, 15 years. And not that he almost destroyed it, but I mean, I mean the, the missed opportunity cost, I mean, the stock was up 10% the day he retired, which speaks to it. And then you have Satya coming in and kind of out of out of nowhere. I don't think he was that well known. I, I, you know, I, I'm not plug, super deeply plugged into the circles, but he's just the one that's most surprises me because he's not a founder, but I think he's proven, as you said, he, he digested the paranoid survive and uh, just for him to step into that role and be so successful, you know, it's really interesting. And then Microsoft under Balmer is interesting as the case study of, Hey, these companies that seem bulletproof, they miss 10 years worth of trends because they've got a bad manager. And that's what, this is what ends up happening with them. Fortunately for all of them, I don't think any of them really have a bad manager at the top. Just behind Netflix, what would your second, what would your runner-up be for most likely 10 years from now? Oh, that's, that's tough. Um, I think you could say that face, well, Facebook or Apple would be the ones where I think the regulatory problems could hit them exceptionally yeah. hard. Yeah. Like in Facebook's case, they're just such a natural scapegoat. Every election the loser will believe that the winner won because Facebook was manipulated yep. and it's a narrative. And then since both sides, it's, it's never visible to you if people you disagree with are getting punished by Facebook, but it's very yep. visible if people you agree with are. So, um, so one of the most bipartisan views on Facebook is Facebook is helping my political opponents get their views across and censoring people I like. So there's just a lot of, uh, a lot of willingness and we just have to find something they actually did wrong. And we have, Circumstantial evidence from Zuckerberg's IMs and um, and his text messages when he was trying to buy Instagram, but a lot of that you could read it in a really damning way. You could say he's trying to take out a competitor. You can also say um, Zuckerberg knows a lot about social media. He found a social media product that's growing that would be complementary to Facebook, and so he wants to own it and he wants it to help that company grow because they 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 don't have Facebook's back end, but they do have. Um, they do have a similar kind of product. <laughs> Got a kid coming in here? Yeah, yeah. She's, uh, <laughs> my dog. Right. How old are your kids? I have a one-year-old, a two-year-old, and a four-year-old. Oh, um, man, I can't believe you found an hour. Child. You, know, you know, one of the questions for you was, how do you write so much having young kids? Um, yeah, that, I, I mostly, uh, my wife does a really good job. Um, making sure that happens. So I, I basically work uh, a normal or normal plus length of time, in a typical day. Um, my schedule has shifted around a lot over time, but um, I generally get several three to four hour chunks to just work on stuff each day. So 
that's it. I just I spent a lot of time on this, and that's that's how the outlook gets done. Last question, because I can see the kids are are popping in, so probably time to wrap this up. Just we covered, you know, Fang, Fang Plus, whatever you want to call it today. That's a lot of tech companies we didn't talk about. You know, Spotify, Shopify, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat, Tesla, Uber, Stripe, PayPal, uh, tons of legacy tech companies. Out of all the companies that we didn't cover, all the tech companies we didn't cover, who do you think would be the most likely 10 years from now for us to kind of lump them into the fangs and say, this company is inevitable? Um, of the ones you mentioned, Stripe has the best shot. Um, I, everyone I've talked to at Stripe is really, really smart. Um, they're actually really nice, but they also ship and there must be some some dark secret there um, so, somehow because usually they're, they're like companies where everyone's really really nice and they all get along really well together and the product is what the product was 10 years ago and they haven't added anything new and then there are some companies where they're constantly launching new things and like you talk to people who work there and you check their knuckles to see if the knuckles are bleeding because they had a fist fight with someone at the last conference or the last meeting they had like there are there are companies that are at both ends of that spectrum and then stripe does a really good job of shipping things, shipping things that look great and work great as soon as they come out. Um, they think really far ahead. And um, one of the advantages they have is that they, they seem to be a very writing centric company. Like a lot of their code gets documented thoroughly. A lot of people write lengthy things internally. A lot of people at Stripe seem to read a lot. Um, so it's, it's a very, very word centric company. And um, I look at Amazon and that's one of the things that sets Amazon apart. Um, but also, I guess when we look at a lot of these successful tech companies, when information leaks about them, typically the companies are run by people who write very long, but not excessive, thoughtful, impactful memos to one another. That's, that's how they think. So um, I tend to look up to companies like that, whereas companies where the decision is verbal or the decision is made based on a PowerPoint or something like that, um, for whatever reason, that just seems like the wrong cadence to make long-term decisions. And with tech, you have to make a lot of you have to make a lot of short-term tweaks, but you you have to have a fairly long-term outlook because you have to you have to design your company around how foreign factors change, how usage changes, how markets change over really long periods. Um, one of the things I go back to when I think about that is Facebook, when they announced their Series A, it's the first press release you find if you scroll all the way back on Facebook's IR page or on their old PR page. Um, the first press release. It says, it's 2006, they say they've just raised their Series A, and it says we're going to invest in operating expenses, da, 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 and mobile. So six months before the iPhone comes out, they think mobile is one of the most important things they can do. Great, great. Well, hey, uh, actually, last question. This has been so much fun. When I launched this podcast, one of the first names I wanted to have on was you, so really glad to have you. I certainly would love to have you back at some point. Anyone else you think I should, uh, you'd enjoy hearing a podcast from or you think I should talk to? Um, I think, let's see, I'll have to get back to you. There, there are some, some good people who come to mind. I'm not sure which of them actually do, do podcasts. Like some of them are anonymous. Like a lot of, one of the things I love about finance Twitter is that so many of the best accounts are anonymous and, um, they're, so they're able to, they're able to speak a lot more freely and yeah. they're able to be actual, actual human beings, which is nice. Um, Whereas if you have a professional account, you have to sort of pretend that you you only have a professional life or that you have this incredibly made for Instagram personal life. So like a lot of those people are, are super fun and um, can go really into the weeds on on their topics of choice. But um, I'd have to think about who would actually want to do that. Yeah. So I'll have cool. to get back to you. No, this is perfect. Hey, look, love uh, loved collaborating with you in a small way on the series. Love the, love the diff. Uh, really enjoyed having you on. So thanks for coming on and we will talk soon. All right. Sounds great. Thanks.